Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is about to be a shunt wire for the charging system on this 1970 Dodge Challenger. A couple notes on this before we get into it. I was in a bit of a hurry when I filmed this, so I didn't necessarily include all the details I would have liked to. One important one is this fix does not only apply to classic Mopars. In fact, it's useful on any classic vehicle that originally had an amateur or amp gauge measuring the output of the alternator or even the generator. The first vehicle I ever did this to was a Triumph TR6. This is not a Triumph TR6, it's a body double. Anyway, I learned about it from the rewire kit for that car, and the reasoning behind it was it would take load off of the original amateur, which was not equipped to handle the alternator upgrade. Essentially, any classic vehicle with an amateur, like this 1949 Studebaker, for example, is a good candidate for this fix. This is a great upgrade for any classic Chrysler product, which is why I do it on so many of them. But it becomes absolutely essential if you upgrade your alternator or add extra electrical loads that the factory system was not designed to handle. If you're trying to power EFI and an electric fuel pump and dual electric fans and a big boom in stereo and upgraded headlights, etc., on your factory electrical system through the factory connections without making this shunt wire modification, you're gonna have a bad time. Understand that the main point of this video is to help you make this improvement in a mostly stock car with a primarily stock electrical system. If you're building some crazy resto mod and your engine compartment looks like this, well, you're rewiring this car completely anyway, and you're gonna include an upgraded charge circuit in that. This does seem like a good time to remind you yet again that I'm not exactly a trained expert in the field of automotive electrical. But I do have years and years of practical experience and I'm happy to share that with you. Just know that if you burn your car to the ground, it's not my fault. Also understand that if my terminology or pronunciation of various terms is not 100% up to your liking, I don't care. I released a video on this car a couple weeks ago now, and in that video I did explain that I was going to make this upgrade. Many, many people have asked me about this over the years, and especially in the last couple weeks for some reason. Ask anyone who's been in the car hobby for the last decade or five, and they'll tell you that classic Chrysler electrical systems have always been their Achilles heel. The biggest reason is this, the bulkhead or firewall connector. The battery in your classic Chrysler powers the starter to get the engine up and running. Once it is up and running, the alternator's job is to maintain the charge in the battery, replenishing the amount of juice you use to start it, and then continue to run all of the accessories in the car. If you've ever had to crank your classic Mopar for an extended amount of time before it started, or if you've had to jump start it and the battery was pretty much discharged, then you'll know after it starts, you're gonna see this gauge, known as the alt gauge in Chrysler speak, or an amp gauge or an amateur would be the proper name for it. You're gonna see the needle for that all the way up here on the charge side. And that is because the battery is discharged, the voltage regulator is prompting the alternator to put out a bunch of extra juice. Now at this time, it's operating near its maximum output, which on most of these systems is only about 35 amps. If you've upgraded your alternator, it could be a good bit more than that. If you ask a four-year-old to draw a simple circuit from an alternator to a battery, they'll probably just draw a straight line, and that would make great sense. But in these cars, that's not how it works. The output stud of the alternator is actually connected to a wire that goes through that bulkhead connector. The terminals in the bulkhead connectors are essentially spades, just like this. You don't exactly have to be an electrical engineer to take a look at this and think, you know, that is a little bit of an underwhelming connection to run the entire electrical system in my car off of. And this is a pair of brand new connectors. By the time they're 50 years old and they've been carrying all that amperage for years, they've heated up many times. They've corroded and sometimes they've gone into full meltdown. But hold on, because it actually gets worse. From the firewall connector, that circuit is routed into the amateur. And then out of that, it goes back out through the firewall connection again. In case you don't know, the reason for routing it this way is so the amateur, or ammeter, as Wikipedia has told me it's pronounced, could be used to measure the state of the battery, whether it's being charged or discharged. And for that reason, the loads and also the charge output of the alternator were put on this side of the gauge and the battery on this side. To get an accurate reading, all loads must flow through this gauge and this is what creates this power bottleneck and led to all these issues that we see with this circuit. This wasn't an issue at all in 1935, and all auto manufacturers that I'm aware of use this same technology. 
It's just that most of them moved away from it a little more quickly than Chrysler did. People on the internet and various groups love to complain about the amp meter. Yes, I'm going to call it something different every time I refer to it. They love to say that these things cause dash fires and they're going to burn your classic to the ground. Yes, that is at least possible. I have to tell you, I've only ever seen one that was at all crispy. And incidentally, it was in this very car. Usually they're fine. The real issue, in my view, the problem I see again and again and again is in that firewall connector. But do understand, because this amp gauge is in the circuit, there are two more connections on the back of it. Because you have those connections there, it's two more possibilities for poor contact, for heating up, and loss of power. That charge output then runs back through the firewall connector through this red wire on the e-body over to a contact point on the starter relay. Now, the position of that relay will vary based on body style, on earlier B bodies and on A bodies, it's over here on the firewall. There are a lot of different positions it can end up in, but it's the same basic premise. This is used as a power point. It connects to battery positive through a small wire like this or through a wire that comes up from the starter. Again, it really all depends. So again, just to visualize the issue here, charge from your alternator has to run through one, two, three, four, five, maybe six connection points to reach the battery. And every one of those connection points is an opportunity for circuit degradation, for increased resistance, for the generation of heat, and for a loss of charge coming from the alternator to the battery. When it was engineered, that firewall connection was just barely adequate to handle any load coming out of, say, a 35 amp alternator. And of course, as the components age, their ability to carry that power is further reduced. So you end up with situations like we saw in this car, where everything is melted and horrible here, and you end up replacing all of the wiring. Now that those connections are shiny and new, they should be good to go, right? Well, sure, for a while. But eventually, this replacement, engineered exactly like the factory components, will do exactly the same thing. The good news is there's a quick and easy way we can back up this original charging circuit and help ensure that it does not go into full meltdown anytime soon. And that is to add a charge bypass wire or a shunt wire. It's quick, it's easy, and there's really only one downside. What we're gonna do is add this 10 gauge wire in parallel to the factory charge output. This one, instead of going through the firewall, will run from the stud on the alternator here up around the engine with the factory wiring. It'll jump over here and then it will connect to the relay behind the battery here. The factory electrical system is protected by a fusible link. There are fuses for some of the individual circuits, but the headlights and the ignition, among other things, are not fused at all. So if there's ever a meltdown there, or if there's ever a failure in one of your fuses to blow in the event of a short, which happened to me once, the fusible link is there to prevent the car from going into full meltdown. Sometimes it even succeeds. When we add this charge bypass wire, if it goes straight from the alternator to the battery or to that terminal there, which is connected straight to the battery, there is an opportunity for a short inside the alternator to burn the car to the ground. And we don't want that. So at the battery end of our wire, we will be including a second fusible link. I like to use the fusible link because it kind of blends into the atmosphere of the classic Chrysler engine compartment. You'd never know it was there if you didn't know it was there. But if you would prefer to use a fuse, you can do that. There are lots and lots of options available for different inline fuse solutions. You could get a trick little fuse holder like this, for example, from American Auto Wire. I've used those before. You want to make sure that whatever fuse you put in there can handle the charge output of your alternator. With our factory units, something like a 40 amp fuse is probably fine. I use 10 gauge wire because it's similar in size to the factory charge wire. The idea here is the load is split between this and the factory circuit. The factory circuit will be just fine at, you know, 15 to 20 amps maximum, and so will this wire. It's actually rated for 30 amps all by itself. We could use a larger wire, you know, say six or eight gauge. With that wire in place, the vast majority of the flow is going to go through this wire. And that brings us back to the downside I mentioned. When we add this, we're not going to get much of a reading on our ammeter anymore. It may show some movement, but in general, we're not gonna get as accurate of a read. And with a bigger wire here, that will definitely be exacerbated. In addition to the chunk of wire and the fusible link, we need just a couple other things. We need ring terminals for both ends of this, one for the alternator and one for the relay over there. These are actually crimp style plastic coated ring connectors, which I've removed the plastic from. I'll be using heat shrink on those instead. I like that a whole lot more. I'm gonna use this butt splice, which has heat shrink attached to it already, to connect the wire to the fusible link. I could add a disconnect to it, but I don't really like that. 
If the fusible link ever melts down, we'll just splice in a new one. And of course, we need some heat to shrink our heat shrink. Now you'll notice these are not exactly ring connectors anymore. I've snipped them and opened them up with a pair of pliers. That's because I'm currently lacking the bigger sizes to go onto these larger studs. I do like this solution instead of a slip-in connector, you know, the open-ended ones, because even if the nuts securing these to the various components were to come loose, they can't just fall off. Oh yeah, try not to use a torch to do your heat shrink. Use like a heat gun, or one of those teeny tiny torchy thingies. This is what I got though. How do you like my now smashed front facing camera? Pretty cool, huh? I like to use black wire for this. The factory charge wire is also black, so it blends in really nicely. If you wanna be fancy, you run this with the factory wiring and you tape it on there. I did crimp on my alternator side connection and I heat shrink that. This is not a crimping or heat shrinking guide. But in case you were curious, I just do this with the cheapest crimping pliers money can buy. I'm definitely gonna have to add something to hold this to the harness because this particular engine does not have the factory wiring clips. Those would have been on the original stamp seal valve cover and we don't have that. This is an eight foot roll of wire that we bought. Seems to be just about right for this Challenger. Okay. All right, we're routing wire. Now this particular car actually has this big main breaker and I could just put the charge wire on the same side as the feed wire to the car. In theory that would work, but I don't really like it. So I'm gonna stick with the fusible link option. I'm gonna get like a six inch long section of it, hook it to this stud and then splice it onto the wire. The rule of thumb for a fusible link is that it should be two gauges smaller than the wire it's protecting. That's another reason for picking the 10 gauge wire. This 14 gauge fusible link is all you can buy in a parts store these days. And there it is in place. Notice I did cover that horrible yellow heat shrink in black tape because it looked terrible. Note that a factory fusible link would have a little tag on it that says fusible link. This does say fusible link in small writing. We could have used a factory type fusible link for this. Now this is not experience speaking, probably, but make sure you disconnected the battery for all of that. Anyway, let's reconnect it. Make sure this car does not immediately burn to the ground. Oh, that arc is the stereo, by the way. Generally, a car like this wouldn't have anything on battery power, but yeah, stereo memory. Note it only does it once and then the capacitors are charged. I'm in the car now and I wanna check the amateur action with that wire in place. First, with the headlights turned on, it does still show a discharge. The question is if it'll actually show a charge once it's running. Well, that was, that was easy. Okay, and it's not indicating any charge at all. And what that tells me is all of the charge is going through our new circuit and not the factory one. Because we've now shoved the charge output off through that other wire, we're only seeing the loads. So it's indicating a discharge, even though the battery is in fact being charged. Well, it probably is, it was before. Ah, I was just kidding. It doesn't charge at all. Ah, uh, hang on. Okay, that's more like what I expected to see. Apparently I had knocked one of the brush connections off of the alternator. So yeah, it's still indicating a charge, but there's not as much gauge movement as there would have been originally. And that's good because it's telling us the load has been taken off the factory circuit. So with any luck, it won't burn itself to the ground. This thing still has a horrible exhaust leak because headers. I installed a shunt wire in the same manner on my 1968 Charger a couple of years ago. With one important exception, there's no fusible link over there because I like to live dangerously, obviously. I've found the resulting reading on the alternator gauge in this car, another exciting name that'll annoy people on the internet, to have a little bit less action than the one in this Challenger. That's what the gauge reads at a higher rev right after starting when the alternator is putting out the most juice. So again, it reduces the efficacy of this gauge, but it does still do something. Hey, that was a dead cold start after shutting this thing off like a week ago. Impressive. Anyway, hopefully all of that made sense. If you have any questions about this, feel free to drop them in the comments and I will definitely see them. Until then, as ever, thanks for watching. And remember, sharing is caring. Oh, also disconnect your battery at night. It's a good idea.